Greetings from everyone. Welcome to our study group. This is our first meeting on the topic that we're going to be studying tonight is Modern Man in Search of a Soul, Contribution of Spiritism Philo uh, Psychology. Let me get, take the opportunity to introduce myself. So my name is Fabricio. I live in the UK. Uh, I'm one of the trustees of the British Spiritist Magic Association and one of the coordinators for the Spiritist Society of Bournemouth. It's my pleasure to be here with you all. And this is going to be an amazing inner journey that we're all just about to start. And without any further ado, I would like to hand it over to Anae. Hello, everybody. So it's a pleasure to be with you all. And thank you so much for everybody who has the camera open. It's very important for us um, to see you uh, so we, I, we, I can connect with you and Fabrizio can connect with you. And we can see if we are uh, bothering people. No, I'm joking. Brazilians love to joke, okay? Uh, but see your reactions, if it's okay, and if you are understanding or you know or whatever it's very important and also the energy because we are going to be studying together for many months this year so and you know that uh, there is kind of a, a balance and a vibrational field we believe and emotioning emotional and also spiritual vibrational field that um, starts uh, arising from the meetings we are going to see that. I would just uh, say that um, in the future or, you know, whenever the next uh, classes, if you have dreams, uh, many terms that uh, we are going to talk now, maybe many people, you know, are not familiar with them, but little by little, you are going to be familiar. I was talking with my best friend. She's a cardiologist just uh, yesterday. And she said, you know, and I, these days I feel like uh, if I, uh, if I, like I am in a washing machine, you know, in clothes, if I am like a t-shirt and I'm in a washing machine. And so we made a lot of metaphors and knowledge, analogies of this washing machine. So I hope we can wash together, but you, you know, don't have to struggle so much. <laughs> and we don't twist and turn so much. So just relax and many terms and concepts uh, can be quite different or unusual for people, but we are going little by little together. And I strongly uh, advise tell you that if you, something different happens during the week or, and if you have a dream that it somehow connects to, uh, to what uh, we have been studying together, please bring and share when you feel comfortable, okay? It's very important because we are going to be talking about a lot of con uh, Jung's concepts, Carl Gustav Jung, the psychiatrist, Swiss psychiatrist. And because Joanna de Angelis, and we are going to get used to her uh, also, and about the mediums and everything that happens all over the world, but in Brazil is especially very open, uh, even people from different religions or no religions at all are very open to what we call anomalous experiences, okay? You, maybe you have uh, seen um, a little bit, Fabricio uh, put a little bit of uh, my curriculum, what I uh, do. And I have been researching and studying, studying about religiosity, spirituality, and mental health for like 30 years. And uh, we, we and Professor, uh, Professor Lionel Corbett, that I know it's here with us, and I will in one minute ask him to say hello to you. Uh, we have a research going on about um, about anomalous uh, phenomena that we call, okay? When you have altered states of consciousness and uh, you, for instance, near-death experiences, maybe many of you have already uh, know, known people that have had 
or even you have had yourself, or some, uh, for instance, um, mediumship phenomena and other kind of phenomena, telepathic and premonitions, okay? So we are studying this nowadays. We are researching and it's official and many, many groups around the world because this is quite common for you to have an idea like in non-clinical population, so people that don't have any symptoms, any psychiatry, um, you know, diagnosis around the world, it's uh, more than like it's around 50% of people say that uh, at some point in their life, they have had an anomalous experience. Anomalous experiences are the um, experiences are the way that the scientists are calling the spiritual experiences that man has been having, you know, for millennia. Uh, so nowadays the, sci the scientists are studying, the medical field, the psychiatrists, the psychologists are studying. And um, in Brazil, so around 10 to 15% in the general, in the worldwide, you know, population and non-clinical. In Brazil is like 35% of the population. So something happens in Brazil, maybe is our, um, we have a lot of uh, religious syncretism. You know, the person can be, can say that it's from a religion and can go in any temple, in anywhere, and nobody says anything about that. It's considered quite okay. Uh, Brazilians probably are very curious and very open uh, to different uh, creeds and religions. But something is happening also in the world population that, uh, and this is from studies and research all over. I, I'm part of also of the commission, the group in the World Psychiatry Association uh, that uh, research this kind of phenomena and spirituality and religion uh, and mental health. So when I talk about this, I'm, ta I'm talking about the, you know, the population, the global population. And something is happening in the psychiatry field and psychology that, uh, and I brought a little case for you. So we're not just going to talk, I'll give you examples because I think this is very important. And then we can connect. Oh, so it's not something so intellectual. No, it's day by day. It happens to all of us, okay, every time. But the thing is that people don't talk about that. We have researches that prove that 70%, around 70%, it's global, okay, of the people, of the patients want to talk about their spirituality or their religion. And only around 30% of the medical people, the doctors, and even the psychologists feel okay to talk about that. And so something happens, right? That the, the psychiatrists, psychologists, the medical personnel, uh, personnel are not uh, feeling authorized or even comfortable of talking about spirituality with their own patients. And we know by uh, through our research from the last 30 years <clears throat> all over the world that uh, the evidence that a person that is more um, spiritual, it doesn't mean that the person has to have any religion. Sometimes the person doesn't have any religion at all or even doesn't believe in God, for instance, it doesn't matter. If the person is spiritual in a sense that it's the inner search for the transcendent or for something that transcends the, the day by day reality. <clears throat> and this search is something very important and give, it gives a purpose for the person. Then this person is more mature and healthier than the average person. This is uh, data from the research, <clears throat> sorry, from the last uh, 20 to 30 uh, years, and it's global, okay? 
so um, the spiritist religion and the spiritualist religion, the Buddhism, the different kind of, and even uh, regular religions, but are but that are open, they're more open <clears throat> to discussing with that, you know, being having an open mind and accepting that there are a lot of phenomena happening in our unconscious mind and that we have to pay attention this, uh, uh, to this kind of phenomena, like mediumship, okay, for instance, that it's not everything fake. We have already proven uh, that there are really things happening to the brain of people that meditate, that uh, prayer, that are on prayer, that are in altered states of consciousness and say that they are seeing things, of course, not uh, a psychotic breakdown, it's not that. We, the psychiatrists have already uh, developed ways to diagnose when a person is psychotic and when a person is having a spiritual or anomalous experience. So we have passed this discussion already, but usually the public doesn't know that and the media doesn't talk about that, okay? So I was myself a very regular psychiatrist uh, and uh, trained in psychoanalysis and Freud and all of that many years ago. And then because of my patients, I realized that I didn't know anything and how to connect it with them in their creeds and in, in their faith, you know, and that many patients had problems uh, crisis, religious crisis, and had dreams that I didn't have the first idea what to say to them about their dreams, some dreams that wouldn't, you couldn't analyze, uh, for instance, with the psychoanalysis and the regular stuff that we learn in psychoanalysis, in Freud and psych um, psychoanalysis. So that's why, because of my patients, I went, um, you know, I uh, decided to learn about Jung. And also because of my private life, we will be talking sometimes about that, uh, because uh, it happens to all of us, a calling. I call, I call it a calling. Usually it's a, a crisis, a very deep loss, you know. Uh, but then something happens that you as a scientist, in my case, uh, and a medical doctor cannot say, I'm not seeing that. I won't say that I'm seeing that because then people are thinking I'm crazy. Well, I know what I'm, I'm not, and this happened. Uh, so I have to learn about that. So more than 30 years ago, something really, and I will tell later for you, um, later on in the course, something happened. And then I said, okay, I have to pay attention. This is not unconscious. And this is a communication uh, from the spiritual realms. So I turned to a spiritism that in Brazil is very, a, a religion very strong. And also we, we call a philosophy and a science, a science too, it has all these paths in spiritism. But I've been always very open to all kinds of uh, thinking and because I studied this and religions, okay? So what happens is that when I started studying these things and I started uh, studying spiritism and we have in Brazil great mediums. We have uh, Francisco Cândido Xavier, we call Chico Xavier. If I have time, I will give you guys an image that it's a synchronicity because like the, my talk with my, my best friend yesterday, uh, I just uh, seen a person in the YouTube that was very close to Chico Xavier and gave an image. And then I'll tell you this because I will ask Fabrizio, uh, if I have time, I talk a lot <laughs> and then, uh, Fabricio, if I forget to give the image of Chico Xavier, please, you know, just, oh, Anaí, the image that, that you heard about Chico Xavier. And also the, the greatest medium alive here in Brazil nowadays is Divaldo Pereira Franco, okay? 
and Divaldo received, um, you know, he has uh, uh, many books. It, it, we call the psychological series of a spirit that presented uh, uh, herself to him as the name Joana de Angelis. Okay, so we are going to be little by little seeing what Joana de Angelis told Divaldo, some of uh, her books, what do they say, which paths uh, they are proposing. So this is uh, a little bit of how I got here and that we are going to be discussing. But I want very much to ask my dear colleague and friend, Lionel Corbett, now to open his camera and to say hello to you. Lionel, are you up here? Yes, I'm here, Ami. Thank you. And thanks for that very fascinating introduction. Thank you for being here with us. Mm -hmm. And I have the pleasure uh, because I, I put one of uh, Lionel's book as a suggestion to all of you. He writes wonderful books uh, and about uh, spirituality in Jung, in Jung analytical psychology. And um, I think I can tell them, Lionel, that you are going to be giving some classes in this course. This is a surprise for you. Can I tell them now? Sure, it was a surprise. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that was our surprise for today. We'll be giving some surprise. Lionel is a professor of that psychology at Santa Barbara, California, at Pacifica Graduate Institute. And he's one of the most, uh, he's from, from the UK, he's uh, also a psychiatrist and a Jungian analyst. And um, uh, I'm very suspicious to talk about Lionel because I, I admire him so much. We have been um, having this partnership for 10 years, probably, right, Lionel? Mm -hmm. And he has been here in Brazil many times. And Lionel, uh, in, um, uh, in a kind of, um, in your honor, the last PowerPoint is an image that you and I shared uh, in Rio de Janeiro some months ago. So I want to share with everybody, it's the last PowerPoint. So who stays to the end, we'll see this image. And Lionel and I were there. So do you want to say something else to people, Lionel? Have I forgotten anything? No, I want to hear you talk. Ah, okay. <laughs> you get tired of hearing me talk. Okay, so I will I will put the PowerPoint and start. And then uh, after I finish, I, uh, Fabrizio and I organize this. We are going to stop the recording so we can talk, uh, you know, in a more, more nice and free way. Let's just uh, share my PowerPoint with you. I'll ask Fabricio if there is anything um, going on with the PowerPoint. Can you please say something? Because then when I put the PowerPoint, I cannot see everybody. So sure, I will take okay. care of that. <laughs> OK, thank you. So. I like to uh, talk, um, I don't know, many people don't know this dialogue, but it's in the end, you are going to see who was uh, this dialogue belongs to, okay? And many people who have read the spoiler alert, the red book already know this dialogue, but who hasn't, we'll see in the end. My soul, uh, where are you? Do you hear me? I speak, I call you. Are you there? I have returned, I'm here again. I have shaken the dust of all the lands from my feet and I have come to you. After long years of long wandering, I have come to you again. Should I tell you everything I have seen, experienced and drunk in? Or do you not want to hear about all the noise of life and the world? But one thing you must know, the one thing I have learned 
is that one must live this life. This life is the way, the long sought after way to the unfathomable, which we call divine. There is no other way. All other ways are false paths. I found the right way. It led me to you, my soul. I return tempered and purified. Do you still know me? Give me your hand, my almost forgotten soul. How warm the joy at seeing you again, you long disavowed soul. Life has led me back to you. Let us thank the life I have lived for all the happy and all the sad hours, for every joy, for every sadness. My soul, my journey should continue with you. I will wander with you and ascend to my solitude. This beautiful dialogue is, is C. Uh, G. Jung in the Red Book talking to his soul. I strongly advise you if you haven't read, uh, you know, that you should take a look in the Red Book and we'll be talking more about that. So what secret does our soul keep? How do hear it, how to hear it? Which path does it show us? So let's say what Joanna Jung, let's look at, take a look at what Joanna de Angelis told Divaldo Pereira Franco. This is an interview with Divaldo in New York in, two, in the year 2000 that he granted to um, the journalist Kat, Katie Mayra. So 12 years ago, this is Divaldo talking, okay? The medium who channels uh, Joana de Angelis. 12 years ago, the spirit Joana de Angelis invited me to write a series of books that she aspired to be of great use to the spiritist, the spiritist movement. For 50 years, she had been studying psychoanalysis, psychology and psychiatry in the spiritual world and wanted to bridge fourth force psychology, therefore contemporary or transpersonal psychology with the spiritism in a language compatible with the needs of philosophical thought in our time. Most of us, if not all of us have at the core of our being, the predisposing factors to our progress and also those factors that are responsible for our failure and our difficulties. And if we don't know these factors, we will always be repeating experiences without leaving a vicious cycle. So the new perspective that she draws me is to create a mentality capable of not staying only in theorism, in theorems, but in behavioral solutions. Withdraw the spiritists uh, and actually the spiritualists. So the spiritist movement, which is in prison in spiritist centers to equate the problems of, of the creature wherever the creature is. Carrying the message to change the world through social, moral and economic change. So the new perspective that she draws me is to create a mentality capable of not staying only in theorism. Oh, sorry, this one, I think it's double. I've already said that, right, Fabricio? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so it's double. So this is Joanna then in the book, The Conscious Being, 1995. The conscious being must always work on himself from the starting point of his psychological reality, accepting himself as he is and constantly improving himself. This lucidity can only be attained by those who analyze themselves, willing to find themselves without a mask, without deterioration. For this, one does not judge or justify oneself. One does not accuse or blame oneself. One just 
discovers oneself. The individual, while he does not discover himself, is always stumbling through in the shadows. This is Joanna de Angelis in the book, The Conscious Being, that is part of the psychological series. So in the, in the other book, uh, The Integral Human Being from 1990, she says, the integral being is a traveler of eternity, making his progress, uh, progress step by step in such a way that the experiences lived in each carnal journey establish the mechanisms of evolution in reference to the next one, providing him with endless development. Okay, I'll tell again because I think this is very important, is a, um, it summarizes uh, her, the principles and why, uh, what's the, the program, why Joanna Jones has spent 50 years in the spiritual realms trying to put together the transpersonal psychology, which I think Jung is like the father in modern times of the transpersonal psychology, uh, so she uses a lot, and we are going to be seeing a lot of Jungian concepts with the uh, spiritist and spiritualist, actually, uh, concept of reincarnation and being a traveler of eternity. So she says the integral being is a traveler of eternity, making his progress step by step in such a way that the experiences lived in each carnal journey establish the mechanisms of evolution in reference to the next one. Do you see how interconnected our lives are? It's providing him with endless development. So evolution is endless in her concept and the spiritist uh, concept. So the idea is then to recognize ourselves as immortal spirits, making the deep path within ourselves in order to conquer this inner kingdom. This is Gelson Luis Roberto is also a teacher. We call ourselves um, aspiring to be teacher of Jonah de Angelis, okay? And in uh, this wonderful book, Reflecting the Soul from 2011, all the, the books are um, of the psycholo psychological series are in, in the process of being translated to English. And I know that people in UK are doing a big effort, right Fabrizio, to translate all the psychological series. So I brought to, uh, some sentences of Jung in Modern Man in Search of a Soul. There are a lot of things to, to discuss and I'm going to be doing some references to this book. Even I had a lot of uh, analogies when I was uh, reading again this book, what is modern, about the time, about the present time and all this stuff. But uh, we are going little by little, so we don't exhaust people, okay? Because I know it's, for me, the sun is shining and it's late afternoon, but I know for you guys, it's night and everybody's tired. So we're just going little by little. So Jung says, the rapid and worldwide growth of a psychological interest shows unmistakably that modern man has to some extent turned his attention from material things to his own subjective process. It's a paradox that we are living. We have never been so materialistic in a certain way, you know, with the, uh, all this um, technology and that we are living in, all this ambition to have uh, material things. But at the same, uh, at the same time, as the research in the clinical field that, uh, of psychology and psychiatry that I told you about, uh, we have seen that people have never maybe be, been so interested in this uh, search for spirituality in a broader sense, okay? 
And Jung, as uh, the, you know, I agree with the New York Times that I was um, made a review in his uh, biography, David Baer uh, biography, Jung a biography, that said that Jung uh, is, I believe he is, the New York Times said he has everything to be, but I believe he is the thinker in the, uh, in the 21st century. The Freud was the thinker of uh, psychological things in the 20th century, and that Jung is the thinker of the 21st century. He was very advanced in the psycho uh, psychological field. So uh, this psychological interest of the present time shows that man expects something from psychic life which he has not received from the outer world, something which our religions doubtless ought to contain, but no longer contain, at least for the modern man. Our age wishes to have actual experiences in psychic life. It wants to experience for itself and not make assumptions based on the experience of other ages. So I brought you a, a small part of a clinical case. Okay, we always, when we present a clinical case for the general public, we have authorization of the person and it, there's no, no way the person can be anyway, anyways uh, identified. So I call it remembering the future, okay? And it's about a young woman in her 30s, early 30s, divorce she has a legal professional she's a legal professional she's beautiful and well connected and has always admired her mother who has been the strong voice in the house and had encouraged her to study and make a career but she has felt hurt and resentment complaining of maternal abandonment because until the birth of her only sister about six years uh, younger, uh, she had been mother's great friend, okay? This young woman had been, had been mother's great friend. After the birth of her sister, there was a distance between her and her mother. In addition, uh, she soon entered adolescence and wanted to date and marry, which was not well accepted by the mother who prioritized the daughter's career, something that she herself had not been able to accomplish, having been a housewife and abandoned her own profession. Upon getting married, she left her parents' house. At the time, she felt that she was being bullied by her mother and sister, who disagreed with all of her opinions. She called herself like, you know, a Cinderella, like she was a, had a Cinderella complex or something like that. She tells then a memory that she always thought was from her childhood. She's around four years old and she's sitting in a hospital waiting room. A gentleman who accompanies her takes her by the hand to another room where her mother is lying on a stretcher to undergo an operation on her breast. She talks a little with her mother who tells her that everything will be fine and asks her to leave and wait as the surgery is about to begin. She is, ten she is taken back to the waiting room by the gentleman who accompan accompanied her. At this point, the memory of the episode ends. She also remembers that when she was around six or seven years old, she had asked her mother how her breast felt after the surgery. And she remembers that the mother turned pale and very scared and asked how she knew about the surgery, to which she reported the meeting. She was six years old, people. So to which she reported the meeting between them with the presence of the man who accompanied, accompanied her and even details such as which breast was operated on. However, it was only years later that her mother told her that the breast surgery had taken place a few years before her birth. During her, adoles uh, her adolescence and early adulthood, she had 
forgotten the episode. So during her analytical process, she rescued the episode and has developed her own readings, explorations, and search for answers, turning again to spiritual questions. Her relationship with her family has improved a lot. She has been more understanding and has developed creative strategies for moments of coexistence. She also fell in love again. So I don't know if this is clear because it's, uh, you know, when we write a case, it's a lot of details. But if people understood that this memory that she had as you know something that happened in her childhood was from actually before uh, she was born okay and it was a memory because uh, there are there were specifics of, of which breast for instance was uh, a surgery was made so the mother was not even married okay and married soon after this surgery and didn't have any children she was she was the first uh, ch uh, child so what happened is that when she and okay since the family kind of erased this experience uh, when she was growing up we always say the empowerment right and we forget sometimes that the real empowerment <laughs> is for us to connect with ourselves, okay? With all our inner strength, uh, strength with our spirituality and with our own spiritual and psychological history and story also from this world. And maybe who knows from other, um, other times in our past, spiritual past, okay? We can talk more about this. If you have uh, um, comments, doubts, just let's go on a little bit. So in Civilization in Transition, Jung says that knowledge of the transcendent does not happen without a great development of uh, human consciousness. It takes thousands of years and it requires a slow process of psychic transformation and integration of eternal truth. So for Jung, the spiritual pioneers of the world speak to a temporal world from an eternal, eternal world and are healers of their time because everything they reveal of eternal truth is salutary, even if not understood by most people. For this reason, the first step is often to develop the faith that guides towards a future intended by humanity and anticipated by religion's intuition. So for Jung, faith and patience, uh, and patience are necessary from the psychological point of view for the slow integration of eternal truths because the pursuit of them gives meaning and purpose to our lives. It develops our, our spirituality. However, we must be aware that this search is slow and requires psychological effort on our part co and confrontation with our shadows. As Jung called the contents that the ego rejects for disturbing our image of our, ourselves. So don't give up, right, Fabrizio? In the, <laughs> I, I, I made a point of putting this sentence. Don't give up, persevere, because it's the way that we integrate this eternal truth. Uh, a lot of things that we are going to be finding about ourselves. The, the, this study group is of self-discovery, right? This is one of the process, groups, therapies, analysis, meditation, prayers, many processes that we have to do uh, to undergo this inner travel, right? And to find this truth within ourselves, not outside in the outer world, okay? So, but we have to persevere and we have, as Jung says, have patience and faith in the process, right? And we are going to be also talking about the shadow. 
we'll have to confront our own shadow because it gets in the way. And it's part of the job actually, right? So uh, to seek spiritual truth elevates us. It frees the conscious mind from the instinctual burden of irrationality and impulsiveness, according to Jung. However, paradoxically, paradoxically, it separates the conscious personality from the natural and primitive man, Jung says. Hence, we become highly disciplined, organized, and rational on the one hand, but on the other, remain an oppressed, oppressed primitive excluded from education and culture. Aren't we seeing this to, in our days, unfortunately, yet? But this explains the fact that the higher we climb the mountain of scientific and, uh, scientific and technical achievements, the more dangerous the misuse of our invention becomes. So our soul seeks the sky, people, but we cannot for, sorry, forget what is still primitive in us. So the search for the transcendent and the eternal truth must be made with a posture of humility. Otherwise, there will be an inflation of the ego preventing us to experience the numinous, the sacred. And this experience has a healing effect in our souls, the experience of the sacred, uh, according to Jung. It opens the path of achieving peace and wisdom for the soul. We will have, we'll have the privilege to have Professor Lionel Corbett talking to us about numinous experiences here in the group. So I like very much this image. It was not myself that found. Of course, I have to give credit to all these beautiful images to my daughter. She's also a medical doctor. Uh, pediatrician, and I think she's here with us too. Uh, remind us what? I love the sentence, Jung sentence, that the sole purpose of human existence is to turn on a light in the darkness of being. I love this sentence, okay? Uh, it's one of the sentence, Jung sentence that I love. And to finish here, my, my PowerPoint so we can talk. It's a synchronicity that we were always going to be discussing about synchronicity. And we have a class also with Professor, Professor Lionel and I and myself about synchronicities. Maybe we'll bring you a case, a beautiful case that is published, but it's, it's in Portuguese to this day, to this day. But I was coming to Porto Alegre, um, where I am now in the very south of Brazil, to, so the internet is better. I was in another city. And when I turn on my Spotify, what do I listen? Synchronicity, John Lennon's and Paul McCartney's The Long and Winding Road. So I want you to just have a quick, uh, everybody knows the song, and uh, my daughter made this beautiful presentation of the song, uh, of the uh, lyrics, because in C, it doesn't matter what was in John Lennon's mind and Paul McCartney, but if we go deeper, that is our purpose. And uh, we see what we call uh, the ancient types, the archetypes, the old forms, that speak to our hearts and minds that we can find in all the great artists, musicians, uh, paintings, uh, painters, and you know the different kinds of art. Then we'll see forms that speak to us and to our hearts that are immortal. And this lyric is immortal. Because we, if we go in the symbolism and go deeper, isn't that the search for the transcendent, the long and winding road that leads to your door will never disappear. I've seen that road before. It always leads me here. Lead me to your door. 
the wild and windy night that the rain washed away has left a pool of tears crying for the day. Why leave me standing here? Let me know the way. Many times I've been alone and many times I've cried. Anyway, you will never know the many ways I've tried. And still they lead me back to the long winding road. You left me standing here a long, long time ago. Don't leave me waiting here. Lead me to your door. Isn't that beautiful? And isn't that makes us isn't that making a circle with Jung's talk to his soul? So I will say goodbye to people that will be watching this later. And I think maybe Fabrizio can um, stop the recording. And we oh sorry, one last uh, it's great one last PowerPoint. That's where I told you. Lionel, where you and I have been some months ago, and inviting everybody in the future to come to Brazil. But we have all the countries here represented, many, many countries, and we are really achieve, trying to achieve with this study group uh, this um, deepest um, dimension where we are all really brothers and sisters and we learn together and we share together. Thank you. Thank you, Anai. I'm gonna stop the recording